Hello. Okay. <laughs> Woke you up. So hopefully your morning has been going well so far. I'm happy to introduce uh, the CTO of the Zen Server Product Group, uh, James Bolton from Citric, who will be presenting transforming Zen Server into a proper open source project. Please welcome James. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for coming along. Um, apologies for the late start. I think we've got a bit of a rolling delay today, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll try and breeze through this and make sure that uh, we've all got time to go get some coffee at the end of this. So just by way of introduction, just a little bit more about uh, who I am uh, and uh, why I want to talk on Zen Server. Um, I've been with the ZenSource team. Um, ZenSource is a startup uh, that was acquired by Citrix doing Zen stuff uh, since 2005. And currently, I'm responsible for the technology strategy, the architectural plans, and so on uh, within the Zen Server team, uh, based in Cambridge over in the UK, um, but uh, over here uh, rather a lot these days. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Zen Server's history, um, particularly as it relates to open source. Um, we've all heard lots of good things today from Jim on the value of open source collaboration. Um, Zen servers uh, had an interesting history in its uh, origins as with an open source hypervisor uh, moving through a proprietary product to now being a fully, or at least making it transition towards being a fully open source project. So I'll talk a bit about some of the things we've done along the way, some of the things we got wrong, and some of the things we're going to do about it. So some of the architectural and technical changes we're going to be making, um, and a little bit about where we're going with the platform in the future. So just to start off with, um, who in the room knows about Zen Server? You put your hands up. So a good, good half of you. Um, so I'll go very quickly through a overview of what Zen Server is, just so that we've got the terminology uh, and understand the differences particularly between Zen and Zen Server, uh, and that'll frame the, uh, the rest of the discussion. So Zen, to start with. Zen is a hypervisor. Uh, it's a, it, Zen's, uh, what, uh, 11 years old now. Um, it started as an academic project at the University of Cambridge. Um, we can actually trace the project's origins right the way back to 1999, uh, but Zen, as we know it today, uh, came into existence in 2002 uh, and became an open source project at around that time. Uh, the hypervisor is the low-level piece that runs on the bare metal. It virtualizes compute, so it acts as a, a CP scheduler, um, and memory, so it, uh, it allocates memory and uh, provides, um, in the, the fully virtualized case, the extra layer of translation uh, using uh, uh, either shadow page tables or Intel or AMD connected virtualization. It also polices access to I.O. devices, uh, so allows higher level functions to virtualize network I.O., storage I.O., and so on. So in a Zen-based system, uh, we've got uh, a number of key pieces. We've got the, uh, the, the hypervisor itself over here sitting on the metal. Uh, but one of the key things we have on top of this, uh, in a similar manner to KVM systems, is we have a Linux environment. Um, although Zen's not tied to Linux, uh, it is the predominant uh, uh, environment that we use on top is what we call the control domain or domain zero. And this is where we run everything that we don't put in the hypervisor itself. Uh, so that's where we run the I.O. virtualization. So for example, using Linux bridging to virtualize networking, uh, or the open virtual switch is another example, uh, using LVM and, or, or other techniques to virtualize storage and so on. It's also where we put the tool stack. Uh, and obviously we've got a, a Linux kernel in there, a ZenAware uh, para-virtualized Linux kernel. So when we talk about Zen, the bits we tend to mean are the hypervisor itself down at the bottom, um, and a low-level part of the tool stack for managing that hypervisor. Uh, so that's the Zen project, uh, a collaborative project with the Linux Foundation since April of this year. And this is what we mean by Zen Server. So Zen is kind of the engine, if you like, the engine that powers the car. On its own, it's actually not that useful. You've got to put it with all these other pieces in order to do something useful. So what Zen Server does is it takes Zen and it packages it up uh, to use as a system. So it's effectively a distribution of Zen, a Linux environment, a kernel, a tool stack, networking pieces, storage pieces, all the things you need to, to build a working virtualization system. Uh, it's also made 
in some respects, this is perhaps a bad place to say this, it's, it's designed to hide its Linux internals to, uh, to some extent. Uh, Zen Server originally as a commercial product was targeting Windows IT admins. Uh, so we didn't want them to, uh, to be scared off by the fact there was uh, uh, this uh, rather high power, but perhaps to them quite uh, daunting operating system underneath. So we packaged it all up. Uh, we we shrink-wrapped it, as we like to say. We put this 10 minutes to Zen or 10 to Zen uh, installer wrapper around it so you could stick in a CD, answer a few questions, and then very soon uh, have a working Zen system. In fact, we are probably more limited by the, uh, the boot time of a modern server uh, than by the, uh, the installation experience. So we're adding a lot of features on top. So Zen does the basic virtualization. Zen server takes that and puts a whole load of features, high availability, um, the authentication to integrate, for example, with, with uh, Active Directory. There's, there's also some uh, LDAP capability in there, although we don't tend to expose that at the moment. So going back to our picture, we've got our, our Zen hypervisor, but now we've put in quite a few other bits and pieces. We've put in the Linux environment we're using in a true open source Zen sense. You can use any environment you want. We've chosen one. Our users just want a system, um, and then we've put a I apologize for the location. We put a Windows.net uh, UI on top, and that's uh, used to manage the system. So that's what Zen Server is. And uh, uh, well, I've got the opportunity, a quick plug. We have the Zen Project User Summit on Wednesday uh, here in uh, co-located with the uh, LinuxCon event. Uh, myself and, and Russ here uh, will be talking a bit more on the differences between Zen, Zen Server, and its tool stack. So hopefully today just giving you a little bit of an overview just to frame the rest of the discussion. So a bit of history. So Zen Server itself was really started back in 2006. Uh, Zen Source, the startup, uh, predates that. Um, we, we had a couple ago at a couple of other products, didn't really work out. So Zen Server, or Zen Enterprise as we called it originally, uh, is what we ended up building. So the timeline goes back to 2006. So let's let's start exploring. Uh, some of the history. So where do we start with? Well, we started with a very basic product, single host product. Um, it used a, uh, a squash first minimal uh, domain zero Linux environment, uh, read only, uh, which to build your first product in a way that you can't modify at runtime is actually quite challenging. Uh, but luckily back then we didn't have very many customers, so uh, it wasn't too hard. We then have on top of that the, the low level uh, Zen libraries, um, libzen control, and Zend. Um, Zend was the original um, tool stack for the open source Zen project. It's since been replaced, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the Citrix product, or Zen source product, sorry, at the time, uh, was actually built on top of that. So we had a proprietary C-based agent that ran on top of that, and then we had a proprietary Java UI uh, that, that talked to that. And the whole glue, everything that put, that put that system together was not open source. Plenty of open source pieces, of course, but the way we put it together wasn't. So that was back in 2006. We had uh, three releases of that product line. We added support for Windows VMs in the second release. Um, and then we, we put a bit of more storage support, put a bit more polish into our third release. But then from there, we moved on to looking at uh, building bigger systems. So these were all single host solutions. So then we looked to build a clustered uh, solution. So in parallel with shipping that first uh, line of products to get our foot in the door with our customers, uh, we built the new generation. And what we did, we actually got rid of uh, the existing tool stack. We kept the same Zen underneath. We'd moved on to a newer version by that point, but fundamentally the same thing. And we wrote a complete new tool stack in the OCaml object-oriented, functional-ish uh, language. We actually use it in a fairly imperative style. Um, we are, with Jane Street Bank, we're, we're one of the largest commercial users of OCaml. And uh, it, it has its challenges, but it has actually worked out quite well for us. One of the things you'll note that we did was we actually pushed Endy, the, open, the official open source tool stack, off to the side. Uh, and we actually interfaced at a lower level. Um, and that's still true today in all shipping Zen servers. And that does introduce some challenges. And I'll talk a little bit later on about why that's a problem and what we're gonna do about it. We also put on, again, because we're targeting the Windows market, uh, we put on a .NET 
uh, UI on top, Zen Center as it's called. Um, and uh, again, that was proprietary. Originally, the OCaml was proprietary as well. And again, the way the system was put together um, was again using plenty of open source pieces. Um, CentOS uh, 5 uh, point whatever, I, I forget which one we started with, we're up to about 5.7 now, uh, was our beta. So from there, where do we go next? We moved on to, in 2009 to open source our OCaml tool stack. So we wanted to drive more adoption of Zen Server within the emerging cloud uh, market. So OpenStack was starting to ramp up. We wanted to uh, get some buy-in from the cloud uh, community. Obviously KVM, as we know, is very strong in the OpenStack world. Uh, we want to make sure that Zen Server, which has been uh, proven uh, in many cloud environments, of course Zen is used at Amazon as well, uh, that we remove some of the barriers to entry um, in, in that environment. So one of the things we did was we open sourced the OCaml tool stack. Uh, that was went up on GitHub in 2009, and we released a, a thing that we call XCP uh, to go with it. Now XCP is a term that's become overloaded over the years. Uh, it stands for the Zen Cloud Platform. Uh, one of the things uh, that it means is the, the OCaml project itself. Zappy is, is the, uh, the official name, the, the Zen API. The other thing that it means is an ISO, a, CD, a binary CD-based distribution uh, that is basically Zen server without some of the proprietary bits. So we took out uh, the, uh, the, the things that we couldn't redistribute in that manner. Uh, we had some, some non-free and open source uh, packages from some hardware vendors, uh, you know, the likes of Emulex and so on for some of their CLIs. Uh, so what we ended up with was basically a debranded Zen server uh, without uh, proprietary bits that could be used as a container to run the open source OCaml tool stack. So that was 2009. So we continued uh, doing that for a while. Uh, we didn't expect to get a lot of contributions to the open source project. Um, we got one or two, uh, mostly from friends and family. A few alumni of, uh, of Zensource contributed, but that, uh, uh, the intention wasn't to open it up and uh, sit back and watch the code flow in. As, uh, I think I said to one of our senior managers at the time. So in uh, 2011 uh, and into 2012, uh, we had a project, Project Thronos, which was to get the OCaml tool stack more widely used. And again, we're really targeting the use within cloud environments. So we wanted to be able to have people who are using, say, Debian or Ubuntu to be able to type apt get install Zappy or apt get install XCP and be able to have a working Zen server-like or XCP-like environment. So we took the now open source tool stack and we packaged it, we worked with the, the Debian and Ubuntu communities to get that packaged uh, for Ubuntu uh, 12.04 uh, and Debian 7. Now the challenge with this is that we did it in a divergent way uh, because we were also busy building the shrink-wrapped Zen server product some of the changes that we made uh, to be able to package for Debian uh, were divergent from what we've done with our big monolithic build that we have internally within Citrix, uh, different from what we're doing for the CentOS-based environment. Uh, we didn't have an awful lot of respect for uh, the fire, file system hierarchy standard, so there's quite a bit of, uh, of cleaning up work we did. But because that was a divergent fork, maintaining it is real, a real challenge for us. It's a liability, it's an extra cost. And I know we've, in the last, uh, few weeks, we, we've hit a few problems making sure that we can continue to have that package uh, within Debian as uh, changes are made to Debian itself. And obviously we're busy working on, uh, on the mainline code base, not the divergent one. So that brings us right up to, uh, or the next step brings us right up to, uh, to date. Uh, earlier on this year, in uh, June, we released, um, Citrix released Zen Server 6.2. Uh, the most recent shipping uh, version of the product. Uh, and at the same time, we announced that we would be making the remainder of Zen Server uh, open source. And I'm gonna talk more today about what that really means. Uh, obviously, it was a press release at the time, um, uh, but we're gonna dig in today a little bit more about what's actually happened uh, under the hood. So one of the things that's changed in the picture we've been building up here is we open source the UI. Um, there's a bit more to it than just that. Uh, and that's what we're gonna look into a bit more uh, detail on today. So 
so we had a nice press release, lots of, lots of noise, lots of uh, 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 supporting statements from other vendors, lots of tweeting and all of that. Um, but that eventually dies down. A, a press release lasts a week if you're very lucky. So uh, we're going to see now what, what it really means to move to this newer model. So a few things what maybe we're trying to do. Are we trying to just stick the code up on the web and walk away? Uh, we tried that uh, with, uh, with the XCP thing a few years back. That's not what we're trying to achieve. It's not what we're trying to do. The next one, is it just about PR? Is this just a marketing stunt? Well, my job is to make sure that it isn't. Um, so I really hope that's not what we're trying to achieve. There was a great uh, comment, I think, on one of the, uh, the, the news stories um, that came from the press release. Uh, someone said, oh, great, Citrix is uh, getting the world to write its product for it. Um, I can tell you that's not what we're trying to do. Um, as we all know, people have different motivations for contributing to open source projects. One of those uh, isn't helping a company make money. Um, people do it for, for whatever reason best fits them. Often, as we know, uh, it's uh, so that it can enable uh, one, you know, one company will contribute to a project because it can enable something that they're selling, whether it's their hardware, you know, Intel contributing code to Zen so they can sell more chips, um, uh, uh, Broadcom contributing drivers to the Linux kernel so that uh, they can sell more network interface cards. People don't write code uh, just so that we don't have to. So we're not trying to do that, uh, despite what uh, uh, some managers in uh, many companies uh, like to think. So are we the other end of the scale, are we trying to create an Apache-like uh, community um, or a Linux Foundation-style uh, community? Uh, we did this actually in Citrix when we open sourced the remainder of the Cloud Stack code. Uh, we actually made that, that became Apache Cloud Stack and Citrix then went to build the Cloud Platform product uh, uh, based on top of that project. Um, so actually with Zen Server, we're not trying to do that. Um, so all these things we're not trying to do what are we actually trying to do? Well, really, like all good open source projects, we're trying to remove barriers to collaboration. Zen Server has a fairly rich API. We've got a good ecosystem of partners building add-ons uh, and so on for Zen Server. Uh, and having everything being truly open source just removes a lot of the barriers. I mean, one particular example uh, from about a year ago, we are working with a partner that wanted to contribute uh, an in a small enhancement and a performance improvement to our Windows para-virtualized drivers. Uh, at the time, they were uh, proprietary, they're closed source, and it took six months just to get that company a read-only source license so they could investigate a performance problem they'd seen. And we never even got as far as getting a contribution agreement set up. Now, those drivers are out there uh, under a BSD license. All of those problems have just gone away. So it really does remove a lot of the, uh, the barriers to, to collaboration with, with partners. So what else are we trying to do? Well, it's about communication. It's not all about the code. Um, code in something like Zen Server, which is effectively a specialized Linux distribution, the code is actually a very small part of what we do. So even if we have a very uh, collaborative uh, project with lots of people writing code, there really is so much more to it. And a lot of this is about communication. So what are we going to do? When are we going to go to a 64-bit domain zero? And that's one of the questions that gets asked a lot. Uh, when are we going to move to a kernel that's newer than 2632? When are we going to uh, uh, get support for, uh, for Zen 4.3? All of these sort of questions in a closed environment, even if we're using open source components, in a closed environment, these are actually quite difficult to answer. Uh, within a, a, a publicly traded quarter-by-quarter accounting company like Citrix, it's actually very difficult to make public statements about what you're doing with your product uh, without incurring um, all sorts of problems of what we call revenue recognition. So if you make a statement in one quarter about something you're shipping in another quarter, uh, you get in some very difficult accounting problems about which quarter you attribute to revenue uh, from customers who've made decisions about product purchases. Um, and that really means that uh, it's easier just to stay quiet about what you're doing and then only tell people once you've done it. But when you've got an open source project, uh, you know, we've obviously been able to do some communication via the GitHub channel, uh, but when it's truly open, uh, then you know, the, uh, the, the, the need to be quiet about those larger things goes away. 
Uh, the, the, uh, I don't want to make this into a Citrix product pitch. That's not, not the point of this talk. But the way that Citrix makes money off of Den Server is by selling services, support, and maintenance on top. So uh, the, the product itself is free. Um, all the features are available free. So therefore, we don't have any of those, those barriers uh, because we're not selling it. So how could we possibly be making uh, revenue affecting uh, uh, decisions or having, causing revenue affecting decisions to be made um, by talking about what we're doing? The other thing is we've got a very large user base. Um, you know, as somebody who's, uh, who's paid by Citrix, I, I wish more of those users were paying customers, but, but, but the, the fact we've got a large user base is actually incredibly good. And a lot of people have got very good ideas and good uh, solutions to problems. So actually creating a, more of a user community around Zen Server is, in my view, actually more important than creating a develop com developer community around Zen Server. Um, and we've already seen on uh, the mailing list that we're now getting good people sorting out each other's problems. We've had this for a little while on the, the, Zen, the Zen API tool stack mailing list. Um, and we're now extending that to the wider Zen Server mailing list. So actually having a community of users benefits everybody. It benefits the users uh, themselves. Obviously, if one user can help another user, um, then that's much higher bandwidth than if me and my team have to help everyone individually. Uh, it also means that those suggestions, the bug fixes, the, the problems that have been pointed out, feed back into making Zen Server better. So creating more of a community around that really does, does help the, uh, the overall platform. So we made it open source. Um, the, one of the things that was often said is Zen Server is becoming open source. But actually, 90 something percent, I've not actually counted the lines, it's probably nearer 90, 98, 99 percent of Zen Server is actually, was already based on open source code. So what's really changing? Well, this is a picture that I've been using to explain a bit about this. The, in this picture, we've got the, the colors aren't coming out too great on the projector, unfortunately, but uh, the, the darker color there, the, the, the three red blobs show the bits that were actually completely closed source. Um, we had a high availability daemon. Uh, we could have pools of up to 16 hosts in a cluster with, with high availability to restart VMs and transfer the master function between hosts. Um, the Windows uh, power virtualized device drivers, uh, they were proprietary and our Zen Center UI. But actually, apart from that, most of the code is actually already based on, on open source code, either stuff we'd written or stuff we've used elsewhere. But a lot of it was actually not developed in an open way. So of course, we would uh, comply with, our, uh, with the GPL. So we'd always ship source when we ship binary. Um, but that's not, that's not being open. That's, that's just uh, being legal. So a lot of these components, we would be, uh, we'd have large patch queues against. I mean, things like we use a very old version of QMU. So we would have a fairly large uh, patch queue against QMU. But we wouldn't actually share that patch queue until we release the product. And even then, we'd quite often collapse down certainly the history on the repositories and quite often the patches themselves. So really kind of doing the bare minimum to a certain extent. Um, uh, we, we fairly heavily modify CentOS 5 as well uh, as our DOM0 environment. We've got a lot of, uh, of updated packages. We've patched packages. We've brought in newer versions. And again, you know, we'll ship the source RPMs when we ship the product. But all of the development, the thinking that goes into that kind of gets uh, hidden. So it's open source, but not uh, not done in an open source manner. So what we're moving towards uh, after the change that we, we started a few months back is a position where everything is open source. So we have a GPL or BSD or Apache or whatever is the most appropriate license. And it will vary. For example, we can't GPL the Windows drivers uh, because they get built with Microsoft headers. Uh, so we can't, uh, we can't uh, try and, you know, end up GPLing Microsoft headers. And in fact, we're not allowed to get Microsoft's um, uh, logo certification uh, with a GPL-like license. They've actually got some very careful wording in their, uh, their agreement that, that excludes GPL-based codes. Um, the, uh, so those components are now all given open source licenses, but we're moving to getting, we're not there yet, we're moving to getting things like the patch queues uh, on, uh, as open source projects on GitHub or equivalent. Uh, we're looking to get uh, the, the build, the way we construct the product open, and a bit more about that uh, uh, to come. 
But as I say, the code is only actually a very small part of this. So the bit that I think is more critical and the bit that we, we've actually not made as much progress on as I'd like um, is to actually get more open about the roadmap. Uh, we've got uh, things like where, where are we going with the platform itself? More than when are we adding features, new storage features? And one of the ones that I'm trying to get in at the moment is support for Ceph, uh, which is uh, you know, something that gives us an awful lot of flexibility in both cloud and non-cloud markets. We think we can, there's actually a lot of value in bringing Ceph to, uh, uh, to the enterprise as well. So when, when we're actually gonna be putting that into the, uh, the, the platform, I think something we'd really like to be able to share. The test harness, we actually did put up a tarball of our internal test harness, NRT, fairly recently. That's the first stage of getting that open. Uh, we're also looking to share that with the Zen project, uh, the, the Linux Foundation's uh, Zen hypervisor project to uh, enable the, uh, the uh, scale of tests there to be ramped up. So that's a work in progress. What we haven't got yet is uh, our uh, bug tracker. That's uh, a subject of a lot of debate, how much we want to get out. We don't want to pollute, we, we do an awful lot of automated testing within Citrix. And we don't want to be polluting a bug tracker with all the what I call incident reports. Uh, when a test fails before anyone's actually looked at it to see if it was really a test failure or was it an infrastructure issue or a test harness issue, um, you know, the, the, the signal to noise ratio can actually be quite poor. So we want, we've, we're trying to create um, a, a public bug tracker that really contains high value reports that are generally believed to be true defects, true bugs. Uh, rather than say you know, incidents from a test harness or support queries. What we don't want is I tried to do X and X didn't work type bug reports. So we're trying to make sure we get that right. So that hopefully will be coming out over the next month or so. Um, and the build, um, I'll go into build in a bit more detail uh, in a few minutes time. So we've got our portal, zenserver.org. Um, we put that up in, in uh, June. Uh, we've now also got our XSFL mailing list. That's been up for a couple of months. Uh, we're starting to get a bit of traction on that, uh, although it's a, a little bit quiet. I think we need to get more people inside of Citrix uh, talking on that to kind of uh, act as a nucleus for further development. In fact, one of the things that I think is the biggest challenge in taking what was effectively a proprietary product, albeit using um, open source components, trying to get that to become an open source project, is getting people who every day, every hour of their working lives are used to having internal meetings. They're used to picking up the phone and calling another developer or wandering over to the developer's desk, uh, meeting around the water cooler, uh, going down the pub for a beer. Um, all those discussions that tend to happen between two people working for the same company, trying to get communication going to the wider audience in a community project, that's probably, I would say, the biggest challenge that we've got. We've, gone, you know, we've got a great office over in Cambridge, a great working environment. People love coming in there. Um, you know, we've got very you know, good, good value from having people co-located. And to now tell people that uh, they've got to start having their discussions via a mailing list uh, when they sit next to the guy they want to talk to, that's, uh, that's a challenge, but we're, we're working on that. XCP, I mentioned XCP earlier, and I, it's, it's just a quick, worth, a quick word on what we're doing with that, just in case we've got any XCP users here. Um, XCP, in effect, became a fork of Zen server uh, without the proprietary bits. But in reality, uh, the, 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 what we did was we did just every now and again take Zen server, rip out a few bits, uh, including the branding, stick an XCP logo on it, and stick that on the web. It's not very sophisticated. Um, and again, you know, that's a divergence that really isn't helpful. So what we're gonna be doing is, or what we have already done, with Zen Server becoming truly open source, some of the reason for having a separate deliverable has kind of just gone away. So by making sure that all the pieces in there are based on free or open source components uh, means that we're really satisfying that remit of XCP. So having two separate uh, binaries, um, having hot fixes delivered from Citrix for Zen server, but not for XCP. And I know for many people in the XCP community, the fact that uh, they've had to use uh, a various, various uh, tools such as GPG to unpack the, uh, uh, the archives and, and manually installing RPMs, this is not ideal. So hopefully we'll get to a point where uh, there is one Zen server that fits the needs of both the commercial users of Zen server, the users of the free Zen server, we've got a very large number of those, uh, and XCP users. 
Um, the other reason, by the way, for XCP being popular is that uh, unlike the free edition of Zen Server, uh, it actually didn't have any constraints. Uh, the Zen Server free edition actually uh, skew limited, actually uh, artificially uh, prevented certain features from working unless you had a, a license from Citrix. Um, and it also required annual activation. You had to uh, go to the uh, Citrix website once a year, uh, get a free uh, license key and apply that. Uh, XCP didn't have any of that. Um, so uh, you could have all of the feature set with none of the hassle and you know, <laughs> who, who wouldn't? Um, so those things uh, you know, have now basically converged now that everything is available uh, for free use within Zen Server. And there is now an upgrade path as well. There are a couple of wrinkles in it, I understand, but uh, with, for the most part, that, that works. So are we there yet uh, is, is the question. Well, no, we're actually quite a long way away. Um, open source uh, is not, it's not a project. It's not something you do and then you say you're done. Uh, it's not something we stand up and say, an executive stands up and say, right, do open source, do it by Friday. It, it, it's a change to how we work. And that means that we've got to change our culture. We've got to change our, uh, our, our technology, our architecture, in order to, to actually be re realistically uh, usable as an open source project and, and something that we feel can really contribute to. So, so let's have a look what we've got to so far. So we've got our proprietary components out there. I think everything now that was previously not open source is now available somewhere uh, via zenserver.org as open source code. Some of our patch queues are now public. Uh, so I think our, uh, our Linux uh, 3.6, I think we're on to, we're moving to 3.10. Uh, I think that's still to come, but uh, we're, we're partway through those. The automated test harness is out there. It's so just a tar ball at the moment. We've got a bit more work to do on that, but wanted to get something out there. Uh, we've got our portal. We've got our mailing list, but there's still an awful lot to do. So there's a lot of technical discussion that needs to happen on the mailing list. And I think, as I said before, this is really where the value is. Uh, being able to say, this is what we want to do. We want to move to Linux 3.10 um, as our domain zero kernel. Um, I'd like to, I'd like people to be able to discuss whether you know, the, they see challenges with that. You know, we're going to it because Greg's d declared it to be a long-term kernel. So it's going to be supported for a while. Uh, and I believe we're not the only vendor to be thinking that way. So. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to be able to talk more about the rationale for us doing these sort of things. So we need to get more discussion going. Um, we need a wiki. We've got a lot of stuff uh, on an internal wiki. We've got stuff there that we can't share. There's also some commercially sensitive stuff on there, uh, as you'd imagine for any commercial product group. Um, but we want to get the, the architectural stuff, the design stuff out there. So um, I'm waiting uh, for, uh, for a media wiki, hopefully, uh, to be set up fairly soon. The roadmap, um, that's something that we talk a lot about now, but we haven't really got out there in a published manner. If you go to the roadmap thing on zenserver.org now, don't expect to see much. It's, uh, it's not very uh, contentful. Um, there's a few more patch queues to go up there. The release model, so Zen Citrix will always be shipping a Citrix Zen server release. Um, and we expect a lot of people to be using that, but we also want to make sure that we've got a release model for the project itself. That may be a code level release, like the Zen hypervisor does, but we haven't defined that yet. And the build system. Now, the build system is something that I want to talk a little bit more about now. Um, there's a few challenges that we've got. Um, first of all, we've got probably gone to the build system, just a quick note on tool stacks. I promised earlier I'd mention a bit about that. The, as I said before, we've got this uh, tool stack <laughs> where we built directly on a low level library from the hypervisor project. Um, so on the left-hand side here, we've got the Zen server stack building on libxd, lib Zen control. On the right-hand side is what, uh, Zen what the Zen project looked like. Uh, bring that up to date. Um, Zen now is moved to libxl um, and the xl CLI on top, uh, but uh, we still have that divergence. So the change we're gonna be making is to move or support the Zappy tool stack, the Zen server tool stack on top of LibXL. Now that's a stable API, I hope, Ian. Um, good. Uh, the, the one below is not quite so stable. And uh, every time we do a Zen upgrade in Zen Server, uh, we hit some kind of problem. Uh, when we went to Zen 4.1 uh, about 18 months ago, uh, it turned out something uh, pretty critical uh, had been moved 
from uh, QMU to, uh, to LibXL uh, for, as part of the setup for PCI pass-through. And it was only a small part of the overall solution, but because we didn't spot it, uh, we took the, uh, the new QMU code, uh, but in our own parallel tool stack, we missed that one. Um, and actually finding out what had gone wrong um, through, through testing and then ultimately chasing the problem down to find the one missing line of code we needed was quite a painful exercise. So moving to, uh, to building on top of rather than replacing existing code uh, works better for us. We also want to make sure that we're uh, following good practice within the Zen project. So moving to the upstream QMU uh, important for us. So we're gonna be doing that uh, very, very soon. We, we're on a very old version of QMU, the original Zen fork of QMU. And as the Zen project itself has moved to upstream and now is the, uh, the default in Zen 4.3, uh, Zen server's gonna follow suit. And there's lots of value in doing that. The other thing that is really big for us is actually to be able to build the thing. At the moment, we've got this massive monolithic build server, or build system, I should say, within Citrix. And it's great, it's repeatable for the most part. Um, it uses an awful lot of resource. It's a big pile, is the best way I can describe it, of make files and associated stuff. Um, and it's, it doesn't really take advantage of the fact that everything is really easily packageable. We are a Linux distro. Why not build like a Linux distro? So one of the things we're doing as part of the open sourcing initiative is to actually make it possible to build individual parts and then use standard tools to put it all together uh, into the end result, and then use those internally to actually build the, uh, the, the Citrix products on. So the, the, the goal is to truly recognize that Zen Server is a base distribution, CentOS in our case, we'll be moving to CentOS 6.4 very soon, and we have a set of packages on top, and some configuration files, um, and a wrapper around the installer. So it's a distro, some RPMs, job done. At the moment, it's kind of a bit like that, but there's a lot of boundaries being blurred. There's a, some big overlays, so we just dump down a whole tarball full of files. In fact, most of the RPMs are installed at install time, um, and we create a giant tarball called dom0fs.tar.bz2. It's like 200 megs of uh, stuff that then just gets untarred. So pretty messy thing to, be, to build. I mean, the end result is good, um, but there's no way, realistically, that anyone outside of Citrix is gonna be able to build that. So we really wanna get our packaging under control. So where we've diverged from an upstream component, uh, we wanna make sure, first of all, we're, we're only doing that where we need to, so we're not hacking um, files into places where they really, really shouldn't be. Um, so for example, LVM, we, we, the, ship, the version of LVM we use, uh, the user-based tools, in Zen server has actually got a significant number of, or significant uh, volume of, of patches applied. It's only five in number, but they're each uh, quite significant in what they do. Um, and this actually takes us into uh, sort of it, down code paths that perhaps weren't expected to be taken. Um, so the, that presents us with a maintenance challenge. So we need to get rid of some of that divergence. And in fact, we've, we've made good progress on that. We also wanna make sure that every single package can be built in a standard way. So I want to get to the point where I can check out uh, you know, zappy.git um, or storage manager.git and I can, within a suitable environment, type make, make install, and we're done. And then package that up in an RPM or deb. Um, and at that point, we're not having to do things differently for what a developer does day to day, what we do for the commercial shipping Zen server product from Citrix, what we do for getting packages into uh, Debian and Ubuntu, what we do for getting packages into CentOS. Um, so that's really, you know, it's about uh, making it easier for the user community, the, the integrator community, the packager community, as well as for the developers, which they're largely within Citrix. The other thing we've been working on is actually getting these packages put together into kind of a, uh, a distro on a distro, if you like. So a thing we've been talking a bit about on the mailing list recently, and we'll be talking um, at the Zen Developer Summit, which is in Edinburgh um, next month about, is a thing called Zen Server Core, which is really taking those core Zen Server packages and making them available on top of your existing distro. So today, if I want, to, if I've got a Linux box and I just want to do a bit of virtualization, <coughs> excuse me, virtualization on it, Zen Server, is not actually ideal for that. 
uh, it installs on the bare metal, it owns the box, it's an appliance model, um, but uh, it means that I can't just have my, my dev box do some VMs. Um, obviously with the KVM system, uh, yum install, app get install, KVM, you're there. So what we're trying to do with Zen Server is get to the point where you can app get install Zen Server, yum install Zen Server, and you get all of what you need to have a Zen Server-like experience, but on your Linux box. And obviously that's not what we're gonna have for a shipping product, because we wanna be able to make guarantees uh, about the, uh, the stability and performance and so on. And if we've got a completely generic Linux system, uh, that's not something that, uh, that we can make those sort of promises about. And we're not a Linux distribution at the end of the day. We don't have a support and services organization uh, like uh, Red Hat and Canonical and SUSE. So we, we don't want to get into the business of supporting a general purpose Linux environment. But if you want that for doing your dev work, that's just great. So what we covered today is some of what we're doing with NServer, the challenges uh, that we've encountered, some of the technical changes we're making. And I think the, you know, the message that I want to, to give you today is that open source is not a thing you do. It's something that's, that's, you know, there's no one right way of doing it. For us, open source meant a certain thing. It meant uh, collaboration, it meant visibility, it meant a user community. Um, it doesn't, for us, it doesn't mean wide development community. So the, treat this as a case study, treat this as some information about what we're doing with Zen Server. Um, if you are a Zen Server user, uh, you're an XCP user, I do encourage you to check out what we're doing. Um, if, like me, you've been a bit frustrated at the lack of progress on some of the things, particularly around getting a wiki up there, uh, I share that, but, but watch this space. So do come check out www.zenserver.org. Um, and we've got a couple of minutes left, so if there's any questions, I'll happily take those now. At the Zen Server preview architecture, uh, you have three catalog talk about uh, open source, uh, mm -hmm. public web, and non public web. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk more about uh, what means non public web at preview? Yeah, okay. Let me just go back to that, uh, that slide. It's there somewhere. So this slide here you want me to, okay. So what I meant by this is it's the difference between the code itself having an open source license and the manner in which we do the development. So, I mean, let's take as an example the Linux kernel. Uh, so we, we have a Linux environment. We, we, although we're based on CentOS, we do actually add a separate kernel ourselves. And we have, we start with Linux 2.6.32 we actually take uh, SUSE's SLES 11 SP1 Zen patch. It's actually, a, 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 although it's a CentOS environment, it's a SUSE kernel. Um, but then we stick on probably about 100 of our own patches. So it's all GPL, so it's all open source, but the, all the development is done within Citrix without anybody seeing it. So what we're doing is we're, I mean, like a, a lot of companies that use Linux, like you know, Linksys and so on, who put Linux within their routers, um, it's the, the use of open source is, is fine. Everyone complies, or you should, with the GPL. Um, but the, the manner in which it's developed, the, the, the boundaries on the patches, so which patch does which thing, why, what's the rationale for putting it in there, all of that stuff's done internally. So when I say non-public development for the purple blobs here, what I mean is we're taking open source code, we're doing stuff to it behind closed doors, and then we're shipping uh, the binary and a, a blob of source um, when we ship the product. Whereas something like Zappy, we are doing our development largely in public. Uh, we're using GitHub, pull requests and so on, even for internal stuff. So it's, although again, we're not getting a massive external contribution and, and neither we we soliciting it, uh, we are at least doing the, uh, the development in the open. The conversations are being had, the, the reviews, uh, the, the automated build checks and so on. We've got a Jenkins thing that's, that's driving some stuff through GitHub. All of that's being done, done in the open. 
Okay, any, uh, any other questions? Okay, thanks very much.